Good evening. On behalf of our festival co-directors, Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, I welcome you to this session of JLF Words Are Bridges, now back with a new season. The second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic in India has caused enormous pain, suffering, and loss. We hope we can provide you with some succor and strength with a series like this, JLF Words Are Bridges, that celebrates the indomitable spirit, diversity and richness of Indian and international languages. We bring to you a plethora of original work, their translations and an insight into each author's unique world. The series reinforces our vision to ensure the free flow of knowledge, information and ideas during these troubled times. Ladies and gentlemen, we present today Amadeir Shanti Niketon, Ira Pandey, Mrinal Pandey in conversation with Devapriya Roy. This session is a vivid and a loving homage to a legendary institution. Written originally in Hindi by the late author and Padma Shri awardee Shivani, Amadeir Shanti Niketon is a moving tribute to the spirit of the iconic institution founded by Tagore. Translated into English by her daughter Ira Pandey, the memoir provides rare insights into the ashram, its students, and the eminent personalities associated with it, including Rabindranath Tagore himself, Satyajit Ray, Pandit Hajari Prasad Devedi, Gora Pant Shivani, was among the foremost Hindi writers of her generation. In this powerful session, flavored with nostalgia, her daughters, Ira and Rinal Pandey, speak to author Devapriya Roy about the warmth and the deep roots of Shantini Ketan and its powerful and lasting impact on generations of writers, intellectuals, and poets. Ira Pandey has been a lecturer, university lecturer, and has worked in senior editorial positions across leading publishing houses. She also writes a regular column for the Tribune. Her translation of her mother's work, Didi, My Mother's Voice, was shortlisted for the Hutch Crossword Award. Her translation of Manohar Shyam Joshi's Tata Professor won the Vodafone Crossword Award and the Saitya Academy Awards. A former chairperson of the Prasad Bharati, Mrinal Pandey is currently Group Editorial Advisor to the National Herald Group. She is a veteran journalist who has held senior editorial positions across TV and print, including NDTV, Doordarshan and the Hindustan Times. She is also the founder president of the Indian Women's Press Corps, a national body of India's women journalists. Devapriya Roy is the author of three novels, The Vague Woman's Handbook, The Weight Loss Club, and Friends from College, and one book of narrative nonfiction, The Heat and Dust Project, co-written with her husband, Saurav Jha, the story of a mad journey across India on a very tiny budget. In 2018, she published Indira, a graphic biography of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, in collaboration with artist Priya Kurian. She is currently obsessed with translating Tagore's Gora. We are delighted to welcome our wonderful speakers for today. And now let's begin our session. Amadeir Shanti Niketon, Ira Pandey, Mrinal Pandey in conversation with Devapriya Roy. Hello and welcome to a very, very special session. Um, I have with me today Mrinal Pandey and Ira Pandey. And we are going to be talking about, about many things, but sort of the excuse that has brought us here today is Amade Shanti Niketan, a book that was written by Shivani, the great uh, Hindi writer Shivani, who happens to be Iraji and Minalji's mother. Uh, and a new translation, a lovely sparkling new translation has just been published. And that's what we are here to talk about. Uh, my first uh, question, I'll direct it to Minalji. This book, Amade Shantini Ketan, this little gem, what is the history of this book? I hadn't even heard of it, you know. Uh, actually, my mother was just testing the waters of creative writing at that point. And I guess she decided on first unburdening herself of her childhood reminiscences, which was the, probably the happiest period in her life. And uh, that's how the book probably got shaped. 
she gave it to a publisher called national who publishing house called the national publishing house which was located in varanasi and the owner purushottam das modi was a very grim patriarch and we happened to be in gorakhpur and my mother gave him the manuscript she wrote by hand it was a handwritten manuscript and told him ki aap isko chhap dijiye and uh, he said ki acha theek hai dekhta hu then when we came back to nainital uh, he wrote to say that he had accepted the manuscript and he was going to publish it so it finally came out in 1961 i was in class 11 then and my sister was away in the university so her brood was slightly you know diminished and uh, she had a little more time to herself to write and uh, that's when she uh, wrote this book it didn't circulate too much because national publishing house was located in varanasi the hub of hindi publishing in those days was either allahabad or delhi it was fast shifting to delhi so much later when she gave it to saraswati bihar publications of dinanath malhotra the father of um yeah, yeah, yeah what's his name iru shekhar shekhar right <laughs> Shekhar Malhotra, who and his wife also run the Cafe Turtle, so your generation probably knows the Cafe Turtle. Right. But I knew Dinanath Ji much better. For over the years, uh, you know, I was editing various journals and newspapers, and uh, also keeping track of my mother. My mother was not very good at keeping track of her own publications, so I was keeping track. So I was in almost uh, weekly touch with him. he was the one who first brought out uh, the next uh, copy of amade shantini ketan when he was launching his uh, pocket book series and that series did quite well in it was quite innovative and he started a gharelu library yojana in which you could buy five books for the price of two or something like that that <laughs> so it got a life of its own but it her, her novels did much better because they were serialized in very popular yeah, magazines so this <laughs> little book got somehow lost in the whole thing then later after my mother's death uh, shekhar was shifting much more to esoteric publishing on religion and so on and he was basically an anglophone so i thought it was fair enough to hand it to a hindi publisher who specialized in hindi who understood who he was publishing and why so i talked to my own publisher rajkamal prakashan who also ran the raj krishna imprint they published it and then i sat on his head and thought to it that this little book was published properly and now of course era has put wind in its sail by putting it in english so it gets a whole new audience and i'm very happy to see how good the translation is and i hope that it does very well it's it's such a gem you know i was reading it and particularly because given the times now when we are all cloistered at home uh in kind of a mean way i was messaging my nephew and niece about the book you know describing how they had classes under the trees and so on and they were they were kind of very jealous given that they are now sitting at home and having their classes on little tabs right uh so ira ji my question is it's it's a two part question because i was curious this book also made me go back to diddi which i read again over the weekend you had you have translated little little bits for diddi as well right right and you have translated uh, men uh, women without men or apradni as a as a collection why this book because shivani ji has such a huge body of work that she's right. left behind 40 books right So my first question is why this one and why well, now one, yeah <laughs> well this one because it's been a great favorite always and i always meant to uh, you know concentrate one day on bringing together all her uh, unknown books look her novels and her short stories have a life of their own they don't need to be translated because their core audience has already read them over generations and so there's no point in promoting those it's her non fiction that interests me because she wrote extraordinary 
um, you know, memoirs, uh, uh, kind of autobiography, not really, but you know, bits and pieces she's put together as a chronicle of her life. Uh, uh, travel logs. In fact, our next project, Mrinal was telling me we should put together all her travel writing. She was a phenomenally observant I person. Can't uh -huh. wait for that. Right. Yeah, yeah, and they're hilarious because she has a great sense of humor, you know. And uh, so I, well, this is one of the reasons I wanted to translate it because it's a very little known book, as you know, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful book. The only problem was they were clear that it was such a small little, such a slim book mm -hmm. that, you know, it would have got lost again. Uh, if I had just done that. So then Renal and I thought about it and she said, why don't you think of all the characters and the people whom she knew, whom she's written so evocatively and so beautifully about. And they were all, you know, colossus like figures in their own world. So then she might, I mean, there are a whole lot more, but we picked out these few mm -hmm. and that forms the second part of the book. So, Indeed. you know, it's like a diptych, the childhood thing and then the adult. And it works well, I think. It the does. other thing is that, you know, I have heard my mother's voice as an adult because by the time we came in and she became our mother and whatever, um, I remember her only as 35, 36 year old, uh, that kind of life. A child's uh, voice, which she somehow retained uh, through her life uh, to actually find it, you know, was such a lovely and joyful discovery because what has been uh, for me a great magnet in this book and I think for several readers is that she has not at all allowed her adult world to seep into her memories mm -hmm. of Shanti Niketan and that is what makes it special because she was a child when she went there. She spent eight, nine years there with the gurus and her girlhood and young adulthood was that, you know, so the, it begins with uh, looking at Tagore and saying, is this God? You know, that's exactly the kind of reaction that yeah. a child would have. And the yeah. pranks they played and the fun they had. I mean, they had such a great childhood there that I think that sustained her. And in, in fact, all of us are sustained in a very large measure by the kind of childhood memories we have and the kind of childhood we have. And if you talk later to Mrinal, you'll realize that, you know, that mood darkens also. The early, happy, joyful, carefree world that she prints in the, you know, about the classes and about the, uh, you know, the, the, the various, the, yeah, all that, uh, running in the rain, getting wet, screaming, shouting, picnics, uh, songs, all kinds, so much music in this book. It's full, even the leaves in the ashram, I think, used to sing. You know? So I really thought that now at a time when we've lost all that, as you say, our children, poor things are now growing up in a computer screen, locked up in a room. They must know that this is what true education is about. It's not just information, you know, they are very well informed children now. I'm sometimes amazed at how much they know. Hello. Yeah, you're there. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, for all these reasons, I thought this was a book whose time had come. And uh, it reads like a fairy tale, which it to some extent is because we've lost that world. And when we were, uh, you know, I was putting it through the final edit with my editor and things, this was the background was the West Bengal election car hysteria. Right. It was disgusting. <laughs> no other word to use it. And this war zone that they had made over the legacy of Shanti Niketan and Tagore ki, oh, inko thaku kehna nahi aata, are Gurudev hamare the, kisi na daadi bada hai, kisi na kuch kya. And you know, what have you made a mockery of a place which is really such a sacred space? It was a sacred grove, which they, if they had the sense, they would have preserved it like that. So, um, you know, for all these reasons, I thought that this was a good time to write about it, uh, to translate it. Stories. So this book actually captures what Shantini Ketan was like when Gurudev was there. Himself. Imagine, imagine to have a Golpo Bola class where uh, Tagore is telling a story yeah. and she says how from college they would cut they their run classes. Run and miss their classes for that. Yes, nah, absolutely. So, uh, I... I felt accurate. And imagine her going, yes, you know, running to Tagore and saying, I have to write an assignment on Keats for Professor Aronson. Will you please write it for me? Can you for imagine me. her cheek? 
and he actually did it and they got 4 on 10 Four on ten. <laughs> so he told her, "She sees him at Kena. Don't tell anyone that I wrote this." How sweet is that? How gracious and noble of Tagore, and what a memory to have uh, of your childhood. Yeah, I, I, uh, that's my favorite story actually. From this, there are many. The <laughs> Alu Potol story is also a close, yeah, you know, contender. But so one question that I had for both Ninalji and you is when I was reading it. Uh, Shivani was a polyglot, right? Gujarati, Marathi, she spoke Bangla like a native speaker. She was a native speaker, having mm. grown up there. And um, of course, English and Hindi was the language of her art. When, when I was reading this, I was wondering about the languages that they used. So initially, when, uh, when she went there, before she and Jenti had learned Bangla, would mm. Gurudev speak to them in English or in Hindi? Mrinalji, do you... Do you remember from the original? Or when he spoke to uh, Tribhuvan, was it in English or in Hindi? Tribhuvan, being the elder son in the family, had already had a British governess for him in uh, the hills who had taught him English. So he was quite proficient in English. <laughs> and my elder Masi, uh, their elder sister, was also, uh, you know, uh, she was older to my mother by about 10 years. So she was uh, a senior student and soon became a member of the faculty. Mm -hmm. She was a scholar of Sanskrit and Prakrit and medieval languages. So these two did most of the talking because uh, Gurudev could speak to them in English. But um, my mother kind of just like a magpie kept picking up phrases and she became much more proficient in Bengali much before her elder siblings. I read somewhere that if you have an ear for music, usually you pick up languages faster, along with the intonations and nuances. And my mother certainly had that. So she was speaking Bengali fluently. Plus being younger, you learn languages faster. So uh, my mamu, for example, for a long time, like your generation used English uh, for at home and also in school. And uh, he learned much in Bengali much later. So when he experimented, he, instead of saying, today I will eat fish, he told the cook, today the fish will eat me. <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, I think uh, there was a kind of an intermixture. But they also talked among themselves, the siblings. And then, of course, they lived in a hostel. My mother was a great extrovert, made friends very easily. And uh, so I think she picked up many languages. She was born in Gujarat. And she spent the first few years in Gujarat, grew up speaking Gujarati. And my grandmother could even speak the Kachi dialect. So they, then my grandfather was Divan with, he was the only Hindu Divan ever in that state of Rampur, to the Nawab Rampur, whose ward he was because his father had died young. So he was both a teacher and a mentor to the Nawab of Rampur. So uh, there was a lot of Urdu influence. And then he also taught for some time in a college for princes in uh, Bangalore. So they, you know, uh, traveled from place to place, which was very unusual in those days. And he insisted that his family should travel with him. And partly because he was traveling so much, he sent these three elder children to Shantiniketan. So whenever these people went on a holiday, it was always for longer spell than the others. Shorter holidays, they could not go home because either if it was summertime, they had to go to Almora to their grandfather, who was very stern. He had lost his sight, but he... My mother said that when he touched, when they touched his feet, the first thing he did was to touch the girls' heads to see if they had the head covered or had they, you know, taken it off like mims. So he was very particular about, you know, that kind of an ethos. And then con in contrast to that, my grandfather was a real liberal. He had traveled to England several times with various princely wards. And he was more of an Englishman and, you know, loved his whiskey and, you know, sort of generally gave a fairly liberal. My grandmother who traveled with her husband, she was tied to both these worlds. When she was with her Buboju or her father-in-law, then she was a strict Vaishnavite uh, 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 woman. 
but when she was with her husband she called her husband hubby and uh, so the children called their father hubby they didn't call him dad or father or babu ji as was in vogue those days they called him hubby so um, you know it was a kind of very funny household where there was ultra uh, conservatism on the one hand and ultra liberalism on the other and you know, my mother because she grew up in a hostel had imbibed freedom in her genes so in a way she was for her day and age a very masculine woman in that i remember she sat like a man would sit never with you know primly with her knees folded uh, as girls were from good families were taught to do she would speak her mind she would interrupt people in between she did everything that was frowned upon but she did not do it to rebel against anything it was just because she had not known anything else and uh, you know she, so she she was like a fish swimming in waters wherever she was put and uh, that lends a kind of a picaresque detail to all her writings and that is why i was telling ira that she must uh, dig out all her travel writings because it is again this double vision of an ultra conservative woman looking at Uh, the western society at the same time a very a fun loving ashramite who can see you know how much more than they need the west has accumulated and at the same time also appreciative of the good things that they did like their love for nature their love for flowers and so on so it's it's a kind of a thing rooted in a time which is now gone by like uh, polyphonic writers mm-hmm. and also that sort of renaissance you know uh, childhood and youth in shantini ketan they that generation because the uh, one is of course the teachers they had and then uh, the 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 students the other students so satyajit ray was this you know mm. brooding manik uh, senior <laughs> manik da was you know everyone worshiped him and there was uh, um, balraj chahani was their mm. english yeah. teacher mm. right Um, and jaya apaswami and rinalini sarabhai and arundhati who who immediately i remember that i seen these black and white movies with her you know with her large eyes so the description of the eyes reminded yeah. me of that time so uh, ira ji do you want to do a little reading from the book yes i do both of you yeah let me start with this one which is rather sweet and you know it gives a very graphic picture of what the schooling was about our classes were held in the sprawling field outside sinha sadan under a cluster of shady trees on any day you could walk into a hindi class conducted by acharya hajari prasad devedi or if you wished you could stroll over to any one of the neighboring classes which were trees basically where you could either listen to the german professor dr alex aronson's lecture on shakespeare's plays or hear Marjorie Sykes is lecture on English literature or to professor adhikari as he conducted classes on hindu philosophy and yoga floating above them all were the haunting strains of shailajda playing a new melody composed for his israj by gurudev himself we were the first to sing with full throated enthusiasm tagore's famous hymn on bengal amar shonar bangla ami to mai bhalo bashi Although we were not to know then that one day it would be adopted as the national anthem of Bangladesh, from the moment we heard its stirring lyrics, we realized that this was a song that had the power to change destinies. Uh, so it goes on like that, and then she says, "Shanti Niketan was the kind of peaceful retreat that remained unshaken by the din and terror of the world outside." Togor managed to imbue it with a spirit that banished all evil and negative energy from its precincts. Perhaps this is why it resolutely refused to stifle the spirit of its students. Our classes were not closed in within walls that shut out the outer world, nor did they have ceilings to close our minds. As we sat under the canopy of the ashram trees, the blue sky spread over us for as far as we could see. Never did any teacher admonish a student for following the flight of a bird. If our fingers ached after writing, we were free to put down our pens and stroll away to hear the Santal tribals, who often passed the ashrams fields as they went about their work, singing or playing a haunting melody on a flute. When we were tired of doing geometry or algebra, we were not punished for letting our minds wander, 
or follow the dance of squirrels as they chased each other up a tree. The cooing of doves and pigeons came to entertain us and helped us learn the dates of the three battles of Panipat so painlessly that they have remained etched in our minds forever. Like scores of students before and after us, we also struggled with Akbar's religious policy and Lord Bentick's administrative reforms. Yet what else was it but, for, but the magic of the ashram that these never became a tiresome burden? Interestingly, for all the freedom that we had, the ashram bred in each one of us a sense of self-control. Our freedom actually disciplined our minds. That was so true. Then she says all the uh, students of the ashram had to leave their beds before sunrise. Three bells marked the time for this and the punishment for the lazy bones who would not rouse themselves was no breakfast. Then we made our beds, had a bath, lined up outside the library for our morning assembly. Each morning and evening, the start of the school day and its end was marked by a prayer. Tagore himself composed these hymns and set them to beautiful ragas such as Bhairavi, Vibhas or Bhairav. The unforgettable music of Bhenge Choduar, Eshe Cho Jyotir Moe, or O Anathe Nath, or Bahir Pathe Bibhage Hiya, rang over these prayer meetings, those thrilling notes sung by some of the most famous names in the world of music today. Till I die, I don't think I will ever forget the profound majesty of those prayers. After that, we went to our respective classes. The Kalabhavan students went one way and the Pathbhavan students the other. As soon as everyone settled, it was as if the chattering birds had come home to roost and a silence descended over the ashram. Then a gong sounded and the lessons of the day would start. What an idyllic childhood it was for sure. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed, and I, I was really thinking that this whole way of doing it is lost to us, isn't it? Absolutely. I don't know whether we'll ever get it back. Yeah. Indeed. Mm. Mrinalji, will you also read us the Hindi original for this bit? Uh, I thought I'll read a little since we were discussing Balraj Sahni. I'll mm. discuss a little reference to him and his wife, mm. uh, his first wife, uh, Damianti. Uh, Damianti who was in the hostel and she was much older than uh, these girls, but she would spend a lot of time with these teenage girls because she loved fun and so did they. Kuch varshan tak Shri Balraj Sahani humare adhyapak rahe, unki angrezi kaksha mein unke ek se ek maulik prayog chalte rahe. Kabhi humko akhbar ka sampadhi ki thama kar kehte, isse sankship ka apni bhaasha mein likh kar abhi mujhe dikhao. Kabhi kaksha mein kisi nai kahani ka kathanak sunane lagte, उनकी पत्नी दमयंती दी हमारे छात्रावास में रहती थी ऐसा सुंदर आनंदी चेहरा जीवन में फिर कभी देखने को नहीं मिला हमसे बड़ी होने के बाद भी उनका अधिकांश समय हमारे ही कमरों में बीतता गोरा रंग बहुत घुंघराले केश और तीखी नाक आंखें हमेशा कांच की गोलियों से चमकती रहती उन दिनों पंजाबी लड़कियां एक ही रंग की रेशमी सूट पहना करती थी गहरे रंग की रेशमी सलवार वैसी कमीज और कड़े कलफ किए गए अबरकी दुपट्टे की चुन्नटों को अपनी सुराहीदार गर्दन में लपेटी दमयंती दी आधी की तरह मेरे कमरे में घुस आती मेरी हाथ की पुस्तक नीचे पटक कहती ए पड़ाकू लड़की ये रात क्या पढ़ने के लिए है चल ढोलक लिया कहीं से मजे से महफिल जमाई जाएगी बस फिर क्या था देखते ही देखते हिंदी भाषी छात्राओं के दलबल को अपने तीखे कंठ और ढोलक की पेशे व थपेड़ों से हेमलिन के पाइट पाइपर की तरह वो मेरे कमरे में खींच लाती अंगूरी दुपट्टे को वो सिर पर बांध कर साफे किसी गांठ देकर लटका लेती कानों में चेरी के गुच्छे से झूलते थे लाल मोतियों के बुंदे कंठ में वैसी ही गुरियों की दोहरी माला गाने के साथ ही मोहक तरंगों में उठती गिरती रहती उस चेहरे का आकर्षण किसी किशोर सुदर्शन राजकुमार के चेहरे का आकर्षण था ढोलक को अपनी सुडौल टांग के नीचे दाब एक धमाके की तपेड़ लगाकर उगाती अद्धी राती चंद तारे पशु प्यारा अंख मारे परशु रामा मत्था सड़ैया दिल मेरा जीता तैना दिस वाज द पंजाबी एंड द हिंदी स्पीकिंग गर्ल्स हैविंग अ गुड टाइम इन द हॉस्पिटल इन द हॉस्पिटल आज वो आनंदी दमयंती दी नहीं रही पर कभी-कभी ढोलक की उस विस्मृत थपेड़ की स्मृति मुझे वर्षों पुरा, पुरानी उस रसीली महफिल की ओर खींच ले थैंक यू विनाल जी so my question now iraji is that this is the sort of um 
joyous voice in which uh, Shivani wrote. It was robust, sophisticated, and yet so, um, you know, it, it brought to life that whole place. How difficult it must have been to translate it, right? Uh, you, you have translated her before as well. So will you tell us a little bit about, about the process? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, one, my mother's Hindi was so pure and chaste. If you, you must have got a flavor of it from Mrinal's reading. You know, she assumes that everyone knows as much Hindi as she did. And so she writes a very Sanskritized scholarly Hindi, which many people find now very difficult to deal with. That was one. The other was, you know, how to preserve the majesty of that language and yet, uh, you know, make it simple enough for an ordinary reader to connect with. So that was one challenge. The other was that this entire book is written in the voice of a child. You know, not once has she allowed her adult voice to come back, even when she's recollecting the, you know, the time of uh, thing much later, 20, 30 years later after she left. And that is a challenge because a child has a very direct and a very um, honest way of recording. So to try and insert a subtext or make a commentary on or whatever, but that was absolutely not my, it was a simple translation, but boy, did I really struggle with it because every time I felt, no, this was not her voice. This is not how she would have. Uh, I had to revisit. So it took me, even though it's such a chotu little book, it took me almost three, four years to just do, refine, edit, edit, edit all the time. But by the end of it, I knew that I had managed to preserve what was real in that book. And the tone changes when she talks of the second in the second half, when she meets, uh, for instance, Satyji Thire, or when she's talking about Hajari Prasad Devedi's wonderful wife, oh, Bhaviji. I remember so distinctly uh, Panditji and her coming to our house. And, you know, my mother really looked upon them as the Guru and the Guru Mata all her life. It's such a moving, moving tribute. It really touches me. So, uh, you know, to get both those voices in a kind of stereo uh, sound <laughs> uh, and um, be able to show what it was that, you know, really changed her when she went there and how a part of her always, in fact, Mrinal and I were talking about this book the other day and she said something to me which is so sharp and, you know, only she can say it, is that she said, you know, people talk of emotion recollected in tranquility. This is tranquility recollected through emotion. That really is the book. In, indeed, indeed. That is brilliant. And, uh, and Rinal made me see it for what it really was. That is what I was struggling to do. Uh, and and I'm glad it works. It's, it really works. It is such a successful translation, uh, Ida Ji. Because what happens is when we think academically of translation, as I did, you know, for my PhD, oh. And when you think academically about it, then, you know, you want to preserve mm. the original and all the layers and all the richness, mm. but you don't think of the reader. Whereas right. when you think that, okay, I, I want this translation to be read by the 18 year olds I teach, mm. you mm. know, mm. whose patience is pulled in 20 different directions. <laughs> how do I capture them? Then you, you know, it, it's different. It becomes a living project as opposed to an academic Absolutely. exercise, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think this this truly lives and breathes and brings that Shantini Ketan to life. And I was thinking that, oh God, when is when are we going to have a, a Netflix show based on Shantini Ketan between that time? Because mm. all the things that Gone. were happening. Yeah. And there is nobody, I'm feel, I feel so bad that there's not one contemporary from her time there who's still around. There's only Shankho Chaudhary's wife, Ira Di, who's also now in her late 90s. In fact, I'm named after her. Mrinal was named after Mrinalini Sarabhai and I was named Ira after Shankho Chaudhary's wife, Ira Di, the very well-known potter. So, you know, she <laughs> kept that, that memory of Shanti Niketan alive by naming the children, by, uh, you know, just, uh, amazing and how much she remembered Devapriya. I mean, you know, for us to recall our school days, 
to remember not just the great teachers but to remember that sarju maharaj who who wears a gamcha and goes and sings and everything yeah, yeah and who cooked what and yeah yeah and that um, exactly that hari har uh, the cook who you made uh, and, and how used to slyly slide an egg or a fish head in there you know didi moni why were you punished today <laughs> you know so how much she remembered it's incredible i mean to preserve such clarity into your middle age and when your life has gone in a completely different direction you know after the ashram after she got married it was a different world that she was trapped in and uh, but yes uh, that world she never allowed anyone to uh, in fact the day she died my older sister nanal and i were sitting and saying what do you think she's doing now so my older sister said i'm telling you she must have run straight to gurudev <laughs> <laughs> to tell him i've come <laughs> i've come and and look yeah. i wrote all my life i wrote yeah yeah you know that this was... the thing that that moved me so much because you know last few days now i i got transported into her life <laughs> So I think it's one in one of your interviews or one of your articles you've written about how till the very end yeah. she used to read, right? And this is what I think you know when people ask about writing advice and all that, I say that you know, it's the reading which nourishes you. Absolutely. You, so you know that you said that both of you would run to libraries to keep her mm-hmm. in books. and even I in the hospital exhausted i know even in the hospital with when she had all that fluid draining out of her she was reading ismail merchant's um, passage to india uh, what is it passage out of india because i was working then with roli books that book had just come out and i said you might enjoy this because i'd run out of books to give her. so she was sitting there with her glasses my dear she had she used to help uh, indigent students mm-hmm. so she had somebody coming to teach her urdu somebody coming to teach her sanskrit till the late seven days i mean kya himmat thi unki i i dare not even try and you know learn an indian language forget sanskrit and urdu one uh, thing i'd like to uh, sure one thing i'd like to add here is the great quality that shantini ketan gave her or but she came back with was to be open not only to books but the generally the life around her you know we used to call the this darbar in the uh, when, whenever we went and visited her we would find all kinds of strange people some rickshaw <laughs> wala walking in and sitting and having everybody in a cup of tea and uh, some toast or whatever was going even roti rolled with sub- leftover sabzi then there was a hijra called muhabbat mm-hmm. come and talk to her about the problems of her of that you know this was much before the lgbtq thing became very posh um then she had uh, uh, her ramkali and numerous relatives she had a dipsomaniac husband who she used to pull up then the daughters who were married out and came who was whose husbands were beating them and my mother's advice to them was give them a kick on the back side and one woman one of them said that you know her sasu hits her with a chimta so my mother said you are younger grab the chimta from her give her a whack on her back side she'll never touch you again so that kind of crazy stuff went on along with her writing along with reading most sophisticated fiction or non fiction available to her and but letting life come in through all pores you know some of our relatives really frowned on that and they said ki uske ghar mein har tarah ke log aa jate hain har baha chale jao to aise sab alter log baithe rehte hain jaise ki us ghar ke malik ho my mother just did not ever i think and that is a great quality she learned from uh, shantini ketan to be able to coexist with a whole medley of people from here to here and they were the material that came to her she used to tell a story about she used to go very early in the morning for her morning uh, walks and she used to carry a lathi in her hand in lucknow and she lived close to the railway colony so she walked along the railway tracks so one morning when she was going she said us koi log nahi hote the to bada acha rehta tha so then a man with a blanket on him came and he said to her in avadi bahuria aap ऐसी सुबह काहे निकसत हो तो माय मदर सेड कि भाई मैं लिखती पढ़ती हूँ सुबह सुबह दिमाग साफ रहता है सो इस जरा हम जानत ही आप शिवानी ही 
आप बहुत नीक लिखत ही पर ये बखत ठीक नहीं है बहुरिया आप हाथ में सोने के कंगन पहने हो गला में सोना की चेन है किसी को साथ लेके आओ सो माई मदर दैट डे वेन शी वेंट बैक शी वॉज टेलिंग शी स्टार्टेड ट्रेवलिंग it turned out that the fellow was one of the biggest dacoits in that area <laughs> <laughs> an avid reader of my mother's he told oh. my mother you write very well but you mustn't come here with so much gold on you you know so she had a very weird kind of a you know she was like in bhairavi she writes about this girl who lives in a masan you know among druggies and addicts my mother also you know was open from all sides you know she led just life coming to her she soaked it in like a sponge which was very rare her older sister could have been a great writer but wasn't she created a kind of shantini ketan in the small town of mukteshwar where she retired with her doctor husband after she got married and their house again she started a montessori school in which everybody could come all the children came i remember one boy once she gave us we all sat with them, those children her two sons and my older sister and me and she gave us home task and she asked us to write on why is the sea salty we had to think about why is the sea salty so everybody you know somebody said ki sita ji cried when she was being carried to sri lanka so thing one of the boys wrote ravand was ravand <laughs> that is ravand was very proud of himself because he had brought back sita and so he went and urinated into the sea and he urinated and he urinated and he urinated so much that the sea became brackish and empty <laughs> when she was marking those then she gave him the highest marks so her, my mother said ki aren't you over marking he said look at the imagination Mm-hmm. with the imagination value the imagination so that was the sisters you know they loved anything which smacked of openness imagination truthfulness uh, and new love for life you know very bubbly very earthy loved life they had their dark sides also but basically they were very open in a way that people are not anymore Shantini Ketan entered them and stayed with them. Stayed there, yeah. Where they were, in a sense, one part of them was always. Always, yeah. That's why when my sister said they must have gone straight to Guru Dev, I know that that is what she must have done. <laughs> Absolutely, I think I completely agree. So you know, one, I know that we are running out of time a little bit. I could ask you a hundred questions that I have both of you here, but. one thing that you know i was thinking about um iraji uh, particularly for you but nanal ji you also worked very closely because i know that you edited uh, shivani ji's you know um the, the the complete works and so on before and you used to edit it you used to punctuate them you know all those years ago so my question is that you know when you translate you enter sort of the world of the of that book right but you enter and you're like a pesky house guest you look in the drawers you riffle through the closets so there's a sort of um the boundary is dissolved right you sort of engage with the text at, at such an intimate level was it more difficult because it's your mother's books right i mean i know you've translated manohar sham joshi and that's a very famous uh, translation how is it different when you are engaging with your mother's work and with any other work that you might translate uh look if i find it easier to translate my mother because i've heard her voice and i know what would sound true and what would not um <laughs> if i translated it uh, not <laughs> not quite the way she would have put it you know um so i'm more confident of handling her work then i am of let's say i did prabha ketan's autobiography normally i don't do commissioned works because i feel unless i know the person intimately and i understand manohar sham joshi was different because we knew him very well and he was a great and he has such a strong kumau connection that i felt i if i you know all of us who have this thing about kumau i must translate he was unfortunately he never got to see it but his wife loved that translation and she's a teacher herself so translation is always tricky devapriya you know what happens is when you become a full time translator like i seem to have now become i have lost my own voice 
if i want to write something i find i'm writing either like my mother or like manohar sham joshi or somebody else i i i have so many stories inside me and i would love to write a novel but i just don't have it in me anymore because it's not me anymore i've lost that voice i write in a different rhythm when i'm you know so yes that happens and two i think you have to be very honest when you're doing a translation and never try and own that book uh it was written by somebody else and that somebody else will always be the author it's like somebody uh, you bring up somebody's child as your own but that child will always have the dna of its mother and so that is what i think try if you understand that and you surrender to it then there's no pride left i mean i'm I, when the cover of this book was sent to me they you know they put my name very prominently i said please put it on the side i mean it, that is the mistake that i think a lot of publishers in india they concentrate so much on who the translator is that you don't give sufficient importance to the person who has written it you know it doesn't matter whether i have done it or x y z has done it the book belongs to shivani it is her name that should be prominent and that is why i think it's taken so long for translations to get acceptance amongst readers because if they haven't you know if they're looking at somebody's work through a prism you'll always have a, a refracted image you won't get uh, what really needs to be said i think that is what translation has taught me <laughs> this is this is a wonderful sort of very profound uh, sentiment you know i never thought of that the cost of translation that you know if if you become a full time translator then your own voice must recede in order to let the other I, one i hope both of you will will keep your promise because now i've got uh, so excited by this book and i was you know <laughs> yesterday when i was researching i read about her travelogues to russia and uh, i think to england so yes. i wonder when i'll get to read them right thank, thank you, you so much. much this was thank very you. nice thank you uh, conversation thank you. and i'm glad you liked it Thank you Ira Pande and Mrinal Pande it has been an absolute honor and pleasure for us to have you here and speak to us Devapriya Roy thank you for your excellent anchoring and moderation thank you all for your insights into the art and craft of translation and as always thank you all for being the most appreciative audience ever as you're all aware the grave repercussions of the covid-19 pandemic has set us back in ways that we could have never have imagined In our efforts to help the arts recover from the devastating impact of COVID, Teamwork Arts launched Art Matters in 2020, through which we have been working towards creating awareness about the current reality of artists across India affected by the pandemic and developing support channels for them. Our efforts helped raise over rupees 7.5 million and over the past year, we in collaboration with our partner NGOs were able to help over 5200 artists and crafts people in need across the country. With the onset of this vicious second wave, artists and artisans across the country again face unprecedented and heartbreaking challenges. We have launched an emergency fund to provide them with a range of resources from food, rations to healthcare and medicines. you can contribute by pressing the contribute button on your screens on behalf of us all stay safe stay double masked and we look forward to seeing you next thursday at our next session of jlf words are bridges good night <laughs>